Hello, my name is Brandon, and welcome to the next video in my series on basic statistics. If you are new to the channel, welcome, it is great to have you. If you're a returning viewer, it is great to have you back. If you like the video, please give it a thumbs up, share it with classmates, colleagues, or friends, or anyone else you think might benefit from watching. Now also, you can find a link in the description to all of my playlists. It's basically a table of contents. And of course, please hit subscribe and click the bell notification if you haven't already. So now that we are introduced, let's go ahead and get started. So this video is the next in our series on non-parametric methods or non-parametric statistics. More specifically, it is about the Wilcoxon rank sum or the Mann-Whitney test, which remember if you watched the previous video are the same thing. So if you're still looking for sort of the conceptual background of the Wilcoxon rank sum or the Mann-Whitney test, go back and watch that one first and then come back to this one. So what we will do in this video is take the conceptual background from the previous video and then go into Excel and actually calculate the Wilcoxon rank sum or Mann-Whitney test. Now remember, you might see this written in either or both ways or combined as the Mann-Whitney-Wilcoxon rank sum. It's all the same thing. So if you look in your stats software and don't find it, look for the other name or look for a combined name or however your textbook may have it listed. So let's go ahead and dive right in. So here's the problem we'll be going into Excel and calculating. So Professor Tyson is on thin ice with the academic department. Student evaluations for the course have not been up to the standards of the university or the department for that matter. So Professor Tyson is put on notice that student evaluations must improve next semester. So we're going from fall to spring. So since student evaluations are ratings like a Likert scale, one through 10, it is determined that a rank sum test will be used to see if there is a statistically significant difference in course evaluations from fall to spring semesters. So this is a very common case when we have something that may not necessarily follow a normal distribution, like a Likert scale or a rating scale, a non-parametric test, like the Wilcoxon rank sum or the Mann-Whitney test, may actually be a better way of approaching this data. So we're gonna to look to see if the student evaluations changed from fall semester to spring semester. So a quick step-by-step -step review of how we do that. We place our samples into two columns. We then create a new column. So we stack them together on top of each other. In a fourth column, we then rank each value in the stacked combined column of both of our samples. Now for any tied ranks, we use the average rank. In Excel, this is the rank.average function or rank.avg. So for example, if we have four numbers, and the middle numbers, in this case, the second and third number are a tie, what Excel will do is average that out and the ranks will be one, 2.5, 2.5 and four because the average of two and three is 2.5. Then we sum the ranks for each sample. We could do that manually. We could use a pivot table or some other Excel formula. Then we use the sampling distribution and test statistic to find the p-value. This is exactly the same thing we did back in the early part of statistics, where we were finding test statistics, looking into the back of our book to the normal distribution table or whatever else we were using to find the p-value of where the z-score or the z-value falls in that distribution. Then we compare that p-value to our chosen alpha level, which in most cases is 0.05. So setting up our Professor Tyson test, we're gonna use a lower tailed test. Remember, we can use an equality test or a two-tailed test. We can use a lower-tailed test or an upper-tailed test. But in this case, we're gonna use a lower-tailed test. So our null hypothesis states that semester one, whatever the rankings are, minus the sum of the ranks for semester two is greater than or equal to zero. Our null hypothesis states that semester one, which is the fall, the rankings, the sum of the rankings for the fall, minus the sum of the rankings for semester two, which is spring, is less than zero. So think about what this means in your mind. So semester one's fall, semester two is spring. If the difference between fall and spring is greater than or equal to zero, that means that in semester two in the spring, 
the ratings actually went down because the difference is positive. That means that fall was actually higher than spring. That's bad. The alternative is the opposite. So if the difference between fall and then spring is negative or less than zero, that means that semester two is actually higher. So our assumption, our null hypothesis, is that the ratings have not changed between semesters or that they even went down. The rejection of that assumption, the alternative hypothesis, would mean that semester one, which is the fall, is less than semester two, which would be obviously higher than fall. That's good. So if the null hypothesis is rejected, meaning the difference is negative, then Professor Tyson will not be fired. Now we need a few things to actually conduct this test. The first thing we're gonna to have to find is the mean. So mu sub w. That is equal to n sub one quantity, n sub one plus n sub two plus one, all divided by two. This is actually the algebraic formula for what we did in the previous video with the conceptual example we talked about. The standard deviation, or sigma sub w, is equal to the square root, and then in the numerator, we have n sub one times n sub two, that's just the two sample sizes we'll talk about here in a second, and then multiply the quantity of n sub one plus n sub two plus one, and that's divided by 12. So in this case, the n's are just the sample size for each sample. Now usually the sample sizes are equal, but they don't have to be. That's the great thing about non-parametric statistics, is that the sample sizes have a little bit more leeway to be unequal because we're just using rankings. Now in these cases, we can use the normal distribution approximation if our sample sizes are greater than or equal to 10. Now I have a qualifier next to the number 10 as far as sample size goes for a reason. That number can be different depending on the resource you're looking at. So the book I usually look at has it set at 10. Another book I've seen has it set at seven. It kind of depends. So you need to stick with whatever your class is using for that number or whatever your professor tells you or just stick to 10 because 10 is higher, it's a bit more conservative. Now while I'm on that note, realize that the subscripts and the notation for these formulas can also be slightly different depending on the book or resource you're using. So you might see the mu sub w listed as et, expected value of t, again, that just depends on the book or the resource you're using. But other than that, everything else should be the same. Just keep in mind there might be some differences depending on what you're looking at. But in the end, it's all the same. So the test statistic, or the z-score, is the same type of z-score we've been doing in stats for a long time now. It's just a measure of how many standard deviations our observation is, or observed mean is, below or above our expected mean. That's the difference divided by the standard deviation. It's just a measure of distance in standard deviations. Now, of course, we can have two-tailed tests, one-tailed tests. It depends on our research question, but all those are viable in the Wilcoxon rank sum or the Mann Whitney test. So now let's actually go into Excel, calculate everything, and conduct our hypothesis test. Okay, so here we are in Excel. Let's go ahead and calculate or show how we would calculate manually slash with Excel the Man Whitney Wilcoxon rank sum test. Now to speed things up, I went ahead and prepared some things in the spreadsheet and you can download this spreadsheet if you follow the link below. You can download it and follow along or kind of do your own version, whatever you want to do, it's up to you. So here in columns A and B, we have our ratings for Professor Tyson. So we have fall semester in column A and spring semester in column B. In column D, I've gone ahead and stacked those two on top of each other because remember the first thing we do in the Man Whitney Wilcoxon rank sum test is we take our two samples, we combine them into one larger sample, and then that is what we base our rankings on. Over in column H, I've went ahead and put some headers for things we have to calculate to actually go ahead and do this problem. And then over on the right, I actually have the algebraic formulas because we will use those to do the Excel formulas. All right, let's go ahead and get started. So the first thing we need to do is move the ratings from columns A and B over into column E into one long column. Now I'm gonna do this using a simple formula. And I'll pause here to say, I always, always, always recommend that you find a way to use formulas and functions in Excel when doing things. Especially when you're using raw data like we have over here in columns A and B, 
there's really no reason in this problem to hard code those numbers again. And you'll see some of the benefits of doing that here in a second. All right, let's go ahead and get those numbers over. So in E2, I'm gonna hit equals and then click on A2. That'll bring that five over, hit enter. And then now if I click back on E2 and drag down to the end of fall semester, I'll have all those numbers moved over. What's the benefit of this? Let's say you go back to your original data and you realize that you recorded one of these wrong. Let's say this eight should be a six. So you click that and see how it changes. Everything flows. Let me undo that. Anything you would change flows over. So if you made a mistake, the number change will flow over. So using the same method, let's now go ahead and move over spring semester. So I'll go into E27 equals B2. I could just type B2, but I'll click on it. Then we'll go ahead and drag down. And that will grab the rest of the ratings for spring semester. So always check when you use a simple formula like this that what you get in your destination cells matches your original cells. So look at the ratings for column E in terms of fall semester. So we have 5844. Look over, we have 5844. Good, that's what we expect. Spring semester, we have 9834. And we check column B, we have 9834. So everything looks like it came over okay. So the next thing we need to do is to find the rank of each of our ratings in column E. And to do that, we're going to use Excel's rank.avg function, or rank average. Let's see how that works. So here in F2, I'm going to begin typing my formula. So equals rank.avg. See it right here, double click. Now what does it require? The first argument it needs is a number. That's the number we're going to rank. In this case, those are the numbers individually in column E. Then it requires a reference. That's what we're ranking against. So all the numbers we're going to use to rank each individual number. And then order is either ascending or descending. Let's go ahead and do this first one. So for number, that's going to be five. And then for the reference, that's going to be all of our ratings. So I'm going to go ahead and click E2 and then drag all the way down to the bottom of all of our ratings here. I'm going to scroll back up so you can see. Now what I need to do next is lock this in place. So when we drag all of our ranks downward, we want the reference to remain E2 through E51. We'll lock that in place. So I'm gonna select those cells in my formula, hit F4. If you notice, it puts dollar signs in front of the rows and the columns. So it's an absolute cell reference, and therefore it's locked in place. Then comma, remember we want ascending, so I'm gonna put one and then close and hit enter. So now let me know that five, relative to all of the numbers in column E, has a rank of 18.5. Now, of course, we want everything in column F to be ranked, so we'll double click, and there are all of our ranks. So I'm gonna go ahead and do one thing. I'm gonna fix the color for these cells because it also fills down the color. There are ways to avoid that, but I wanna go into that in this video. So I'm gonna go ahead and change the color. Perfect. So let's take a look at what happened here. We can see that anything with a rating of four has a rank of 11. Any number with a rank of seven has a rank of 30.5. Remember, the rank.average function is breaking ties by finding the average rank for those numbers. That's why we have 30.5, 23.5, so on and so forth. Great, so now we have our samples combined into one larger sample, and we have the rank for each of our rating values. Now let's go ahead into columns H and I. So the first thing we need is the sum of our ranks for each semester. And of course, this is very easy. So equals sum. Go ahead and select the ranks here in column F for fall semester. Close, 514. So if we add up all the ranks in fall semester, it comes up to 514. Same thing for spring semester. Equal sum, then we'll go down, start selecting all those. Good, close. So the sum of those ranks is 761, which is higher. So just based on the sum of our ranks, it would appear that Professor Tyson's ratings got better over time. Because remember, we did this ascending. That means the higher ratings have higher ranks. Therefore, spring semester, when we added up the ranks, is higher, which, as of right now, looks good for that professor. Next thing we're going to do is count each sample. Now, we know that there are 25 observations in each sample, but again, always use a function and or a formula whenever possible. This one's easy. We're going to use count. So count. We'll use the column designation. So A colon A. Hit enter, and remember count 
only counts the numerical observations in whatever range you have selected, in this case, the entire column A. So it ignores the fall semester header. So as long as you keep your samples in individual columns, you can use the count function all the time, which is what I do. Same thing for spring. So count, so this is gonna be B colon B, and again, 25. Very easy. So now we need to calculate mu sub W. If we look at our mean formula over here on the right, we can see that it involves really only two things. It's n sub one, which is the count of our first sample, and then n sub two, which is the count of our second sample. So in this case, we just calculated those in I5 and I6. So let's go ahead and string together everything algebraically so we can calculate our mean, which is mu sub w. So equals, open parentheses, n sub one, which is here, then I5, times, parentheses again, now it's n sub one, which is I5, plus n sub two, which is I6, plus one, close that, close that, that's our numerator, and then divide by two, and that is our mean, mu sub w. So we have that. Next, let's do our standard deviation, or sigma sub w. So equals square root, double click that, now we wanna put everything in the right order, let's be careful. So the first thing we have is, I'm gonna go ahead and open a parentheses here. We have n sub one, which is 25, times n sub two, which is I six again, times parentheses, and then now we have n sub one plus n sub two plus one. Close that quantity, then we're gonna close everything in our numerator, divide by 12, close it, and there is our sigma sub w. So 51.54 approximately. Great, we're doing very, very well. And we used functions and formulas the entire time, all the way from when we had our data in column A and B, which was great. So now we need our z value. This is the exact same thing we've been doing for z values in the entirety of statistics. It's just a value minus a mean divided by the standard deviation. So in this case, equals, our large W is gonna be our rank sum for fall semester. Remember, that's what our hypothesis is stating, is it's a lower tailed test. Did our rankings increase from fall to spring? So large W is fall semester, our rank sums, which is up there in I2 minus our mu sub W we just calculated, which is in I11, divided by our standard deviation, which, which is I9, hit enter, and our z value is negative 2.39625. Now think about that. If you're looking at a normal distribution curve, where is that z value? Well, it's very far down in the lower tail, in the left-hand side of our normal distribution. So we would expect a p-value that's pretty low. So always use common sense, because if you do the p-value here next and you get some crazy high number, something went wrong. So use what you already know. Use your common sense to know if the value you get here makes sense. So let's go ahead and find this p-value here in I12. And to do that, we're gonna use the norm.s.dist function. So equals norm.s.dist. So remember, this returns the standard normal distribution that has a mean of zero and a standard deviation of one. This is the equivalent of the normal distribution table in the front or back of your textbook. So norm.s.dist. Double click that, so it requires a z, we just did that above, close, or comma, and then we want the cumulative, because we want everything that goes from negative infinity all the way up to that z value, because that's gonna be our probability. So we'll hit true, or one, and enter. So our p-value is 0 0.00828. Now the question is, should we reject the null hypothesis or not? So we have our alpha we selected of 0 0.05 here, what we can do is automate this by setting up a very simple function to recommend to us or tell us what we should do. So we'll use an if function. So equals if our p value is less than our alpha, that's our logical test, then we will reject the null. If not, our alternative is that, or if that comes back as false, fail to Reject. No. We gotta put those in 
quotation marks because it's actual text, close it, hit enter. So now it tells us we would reject the null. So we can go ahead and automate everything. Now because we used formulas and functions the entire way, if anything were to change in column A or B, everything would flow over across the spreadsheet. So in terms of the problem, what does this mean? Well, remember that the whole idea was to test whether or not Professor Tyson's course ratings increased from fall to spring. So we're looking at that difference between fall and spring, and we used a lower tailed test. So notice the negative Z value. So what we are doing here is rejecting the null hypothesis. Remember the null said is fall semester greater than or equal to spring semester, because if that is the case, then the value stayed the same, the ratings stayed the same, or spring semester actually went lower. That's the only way that fall semester could be greater. And then the alternative hypothesis is that fall semester was lower than spring, which for Professor Tyson is actually good. That's what we're looking for. So in this case, we would reject the null hypothesis that spring is lower than fall, and therefore move on to the alternative hypothesis that says fall is less than spring, or you can think of it as spring is greater than fall. Therefore, the ratings for Professor Tyson improved in a way that is statistically significant. And therefore, Professor Tyson can keep teaching. Okay, so we are back from Excel where we rejected our null hypothesis. So I just want to show you where the numbers came from or where they went to in the actual algebraic way of looking at things. So here was our mean. So remember, both of our sample sizes were 25. That's just 25 times the quantity of 25 plus 25 plus one divided by two. That's how we got our mu w of 637.5. Standard deviation was 51.54. So you can actually do that out on your calculator if you want to double check that it is correct, but that's everything in algebraic form. Our test statistic is 514 minus 637.5. Remember the 514 is just the sum of the ranks for the fall semester, minus 637.5. That's our mu sub w. Our expected mean if the ranks were sort of balanced, divided by 51.54, which is our standard deviation. That gave us a z-score of negative 2.396. Then we used Excel's norm.s.dist function. Our first parameter is our z-score from above, negative 2.396. The second parameter is cumulative, or marking true for a cumulative, and that gives us a p-value, a one-tailed, remember, from negative infinity all the way up to negative 2.396 of a z-score. That probability, or that p-value, is 0.008 compared to our alpha of 0.05. Therefore, we would reject our null hypothesis and say, there is evidence to conclude the location of semester one, in terms of its rankings, is to the left or lower than that of semester two. So semester one's fall, semester two is spring. So because semester one is to the left, then semester two or lower, there was an improvement in course ratings and Professor Tyson can keep teaching, which is great news. So that wraps up this video on non-parametric methods. We went into Excel, set up a spreadsheet, and then calculated the Man Whitney Wilcoxon rank sum test. And based on the result of that test, we could either reject our null hypothesis or fail to reject our null hypothesis. But by setting up the spreadsheet like we did, we could actually see where the numbers are coming from, sort of how it's structured, how the ranks are calculated, and then how we find our mean, our standard deviation, our test statistic, and then use the normal distribution and decide whether or not we're going to reject or fail to reject that null hypothesis. So thank you very much for watching. Thank you for spending some time learning with me. I wish you all the best in your studies and in your work and look forward to seeing you again next time. Take care. Bye-bye.